back to the horse race, your weekly look at politics, policy, and elections in Massachusetts. I'm Jennifer Smith. And I'm Stephanie Murray, author of the Politico Massachusetts Playbook. And I am Steve Cazella, president of the Massing Polling Group. Apparently the only one still wearing my hat that we were all wearing before we started recording. So I'm just going <laughs> to go ahead and take that off. <laughs> no one is going to believe you, Steve. Nobody. That would be crazy. Why would we wear hats? Well, I, I'm expecting that you'll put back on that gigantic black and white striped hat before the show is over. <laughs> no promises. No promises at all. But I mean, we are embarking on our second Zoom endeavor right now, since it's the only way we can see each other because we are following social distancing guidelines, but it means that it's going to look a little bit different today. You can see all four of us rather than just any one of us, so work with us. We're working our way through this like the rest of you. We have Brady Bunch vibes today, but you know, we're figuring it out, so if you like this version better than last week's, let us know, um, and you know, we're, it's a work in progress. I think everybody's just adapting to where we live now, which is the internet. Yes, we live on Zoom primarily. I live on Zoom at least several hours per day. Um, <clears throat> you know, starting to learn, I think, some of the protocols and etiquette, you know, like hide all of the kids' toys behind you rather than like just leaving them everywhere so that, and then don't move too much because if you move, like a cascade of Legos will fall down and everybody will see it. Uh, but for those of you listening on SoundCloud, we are also recording this on Zoom. So if you really want to see what we look like and what, what, part of our homes look like, then this is this recording is also available by, by video. Um, but anyway, today is Wednesday, April 8th, which I say because things are changing so fast in this in the world we live in now that uh, it's worth just sort of putting a marker in the ground and, and talking about like what's going on and uh, what the new regulations are, what the news events of the last few days have been and so forth. So um, that is the time frame. Stephanie, you update us every day in the political Massachusetts playbook as far as what's going on. So quickly catch people up just to uh, just so people listening later on know where in time this particular episode took place. So where things stand right now in Massachusetts, at least, um, deaths are in uh, around 350 deaths from the coronavirus. Um, uh, it's just things are things are getting pretty intense. We're heading towards the surge. Um, the virus is expected to peak sometime in the next week or two, sometime between April 10th and April 20th, which means that the state is really preparing its uh, medical facilities, you know, hospitals are being built at the DCU Center, the Boston Convention Center. Uh, they're looking at other places to do it. Um, and Boston's actually instituted a curfew uh, that's an advised curfew, so it's not forced, but Mayor Marty Walsh is asking people to stay inside from 9 p.m. to, I think, 5 a.m. it is now. It was 6 a.m. before, and I think I think it's 5 a.m. now. Uh, so things are, things are locked down, and they will be for the foreseeable future. It's just kind of crazy to me thinking about when all of this first started to happen. Uh, I think it was April 7th that the schools were expected to open back up, or restaurants were expected to open up on April 5th, I think, and that seemed like so far away from the day that they were closed down. Um, we've got another month to go so far, but things could still change. Yeah, I really did have that in the back of my head, just again, remembering over and over again that people were, like a month ago, hopeful that things would open up by Easter. And now, uh, you know, here to tell you about some Dorchester news, which really crushed me as of this last week, which is the Dorchester Day Parade is fully canceled. So there's no St. Patrick's Day, there's no Dorchester Day Parade, like the entire spring season so far is kind of, is kind of out out with everybody else uh, as we stay in, nothing happens. Boston, Sorry? The Boston Pride Parade is canceled now too. That's Can right. And Jen, for those unlucky souls who don't know what the Dorchester Day Parade is. I, I, A, I can't talk to you anymore, so please turn off the Zoom. Um, but it's, it's, it's celebrating Dorchester Day, which is, which is the greatest day of the year, which celebrates Dorchester, the largest neighborhood in Boston and uh, its establishment. It is, very large. It is basically a city unto itself. And normally people walk all the way from the mayor's house, basically in Ashmont, all the way up the Ave and celebrate Dorchester. And it's kind of a nice uh, follow up to the St. Patrick's Day weekend because there's much less hooliganry. But this year, no hooliganry whatsoever. Is that a word, hooliganry? Or is it hooliganism? 
I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Asking <laughs> the good questions, Steve. <laughs> I'll have to look that up. Important details that we here on the horse race will follow up on and be sure to bring you. Uh, Melrose also has instituted a similar curfew to uh, what Stephanie described. Um, Mayor Paul Broder here announced that. And also uh, face coverings. That's the other big change that's um, happening all across the country and also here in Massachusetts, where um, it's not mandatory in most places, but the strong recommendation of health professionals has been that you know we should pretty much have our faces covered when we go out in public. Um, so we're seeing all across social media and all across uh, everywhere else sort of uh, interesting, useful, funny takes on what that means. You know, people like crafting their own face masks and people branding themselves with different like Marty Walsh and his Patriots face mask and so forth. So, um, you know, it's it's depressing in a way, but it's also just sort of an interesting cultural moment we're living in as everybody takes, you know, what we what we need to do and uh, puts their own twist on it. That's right. And Stephanie, you had this great thread yesterday on mayors in Massachusetts just straight up laying down the law. Uh, did you have any particular favorites in there you want to shout out? Oh, my God. So I, um, you know, I look at local newspapers every day as part of my job. And so I've just been noticing this trend of mayors just getting kind of more and more aggressive and frantic to try to get people to social distance. And especially, I think we're going to see more of this, especially as it gets warmer out. Uh, so in Springfield, I think this one was my favorite. The mayor of Springfield, Dominic Sarno, he was talking about how you know, the city says, the state says, that country says, you have to social distance, you have to stay out of groups. And then there are people out there golfing. And so he gets up and does an address and he says, what is wrong with you people? Which is just so great. Uh, the mayor of Somerville is threatening to yell at everybody in Italian, uh, like the <laughs> mayors in Italy have been doing, uh, which I mean, for them, yelling at people in Italian is just uh, normal. But for us, it would be a little bit different. Um, and in, where was it? I think it was in Brockton. They the way that they're boarding up the basketball hoops is kind of interesting. They're taking like one wooden board on the top of the hoop and then like another wooden board on the bottom. And then they're like screwing them or nailing them together so you can't pry them off. Um, I didn't know there were so many basketball players in Massachusetts that would just risk their lives to play basketball, but it sounds oh. like the measures they've yeah. got to take. Oh yeah, they very much said to the city of Boston, like, I see you're zip tying your hoops shut, hold my beer, I'm gonna like clamp it down. So that's crazy. But I think the best one, mm, I think they're tied. I think Springfield and Revere are tied because the mayor of Revere made one of his aides drive him around in the city van and he went around Revere Beach yelling into a bullhorn. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for them. I mean, whatever needs to be done. <clears throat> be done I suppose is, is you know kind of glad to see it um, <clears throat> on the national front of course uh, we've we've got we've got uh, the stimulus starting to roll we've we've had a, a lot of small businesses applying for the for the loans that have been offered um, <clears throat> the basically forgivable loans that have been offered and a lot of headaches coming from that it sounds like uh, similarly uh, headaches coming from the stimulus um, where uh, from from the personal st stimulus package where, um, you know, when checks are going to arrive, how long it could take for some checks to arrive and so forth has been uh, something that, that that's raised, caused a lot of people anxiety in the last week or so. That's right. And now actually that the the, uh, the legislature on the federal level is looking at the next potential stimulus package, um, Rep. Ayanna Presley is calling for demographic data on COVID-19, uh, uh, specifically racial data to be part of that. Um, because there are so many disparities in communities of color, I'm sure folks saw the map of Boston that was out the other day where relative to the city average, neighborhoods like Dorchester, Mattapan, Hyde Park, and East Boston were just absolutely uh, just decimated by it. Yeah, and that's even within, uh, you know, Suffolk County's already receiving a disproportionate number of, of the cases, um, you know, relative to Massachusetts. It's keeping up with Middlesex County in terms of just the raw number of cases but it has a much, much smaller population, about half the size of, of Middlesex. So the fact that it has the same number of cases is indicative of what a, what a big concentration we're seeing in Suffolk County. And then within Suffolk County, as Jen mentioned, it's specific neighborhoods within Boston that are getting even a disproportionate number of those. Um, it, it follows a trend and a pattern we're seeing across the country, which is that um, Black and Hispanic residents of major urban areas everywhere, or at least the places that have done that level of analysis seem to be um, taking a, a disproportionate share of the impact of, uh, of this. So uh, certainly something that, that Boston will be exploring further, I should think. 
Yeah, the same thing is true in Chelsea. Uh, from what I've read in the Globe and elsewhere, that's a city that is primarily working class and Latino, and it's just been really decimated by this virus already. So, I mean, until we get data, uh, it's hard to make assumptions, but I mean, at least the anecdotal and kind of small town by town reports that we're getting show that. Yeah, and we've right. seen it in Mass. I'm sorry, we've seen it in New York City already, where they have done this kind of analysis, uh, where you know the the data is definitely disproportionate. Um, and we've also the other data I've seen is Milwaukee, where uh, you know the per percentage of cases and the percentage of deaths are far far higher than the actual percentage of Black residents in that city. So um, it 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 would surprise me, given sort of all of the uh, bits of uh, both data that we have from elsewhere and also just what we do know from the anecdotes we've heard here that if it turned out to be any other way other than uh, that it's that it's hitting uh, black and Latino residents much more much more strongly here in mass as well. Right, which and we're going to talk a bit more about what you're seeing as far as tracking polls go a little bit later in the podcast. But uh, we have a special guest who's coming on shortly to talk with us. Uh, who are we talking to today, Stephanie? We are talking to Northampton Mayor David Narkowitz, who uh, has been working on the coronavirus response in his city, and he's also recovering from the virus himself. So he'll be able to talk to us all about experiencing the virus and trying to manage it for a city uh, all at the same time. Northampton Mayor David Narkowitz is not just responding to the coronavirus pandemic, he's recovering from it. The Western Massachusetts Democrat tested positive for COVID-19 a few weeks ago, and he's been handling city matters from a safe social distance. We have Mayor Narkowitz here with us virtually, of course, to talk about his experience keeping the city running, contracting the virus, and, and just what's next. So Mayor Narkowitz, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Stephanie. A pleasure to be on with you. It's, it's fun to talk to you. Um, if, for people who don't know, I used to cover Western Mass, and Mayor Narcos was actually the first mayor I ever, I uh, ever covered for a newspaper. So it's fun to kind of come full circle. But how are you feeling? Uh, you know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling well. Um, I think I was fortunate in that I, you know, didn't have a severe case that required hospitalization. You know, it kind of hit me like a flu, um, and I had some fever and those kinds of issues, but. I never had the severe respiratory issues that that we hear uh, folks, you know, requiring ventilators experience. So I feel fortunate. Obviously, I took all the precautions, and I was in isolation for you know almost almost two weeks. Uh, my family was quarantined, um, but thankfully, I've been released from isolation, and uh, and my family, you know, has has not had any symptoms. So I think we're you know obviously uh, as out of the woods as you can feel. Uh, in, in the situation in right, in, in right now. And of course, one of the things that we always hear about these days is just how difficult it is for people to get tested, even if they show symptoms. And mm -hmm. of course, there's a variant of symptoms depending on the specific person. So how did you find your experience compared to a lot of the stories we've been hearing? Yeah, I think um, we definitely have been hearing that. And, you know, I know our local hospital has been uh, one of the big impediments for them has been just having the testing um, implements, you know, the the swabs and the the things that they needed to actually conduct the tests. They were rapidly running out of those. Um, so, you know, now they've I think they that a lot of those issues have been worked out. There's now more testing sites available. Um, so they've now set up actually an offsite. Uh, mobile testing site, uh, just so that their ER doesn't become so congested. But in my case, I, I drove to the hospital in my car, um, rolled down my window and, you know, somebody in a, in a, in a suit uh, came out and, and performed the test. So that's how it worked for me. Um, I obviously, you know, our health department had some concerns about my exposure to some other possible vectors uh, that they were doing some contact investigations on. Um, so that's sort of how it ended up that I got tested. Um, but yeah, that has been one of the, the, the major issues, um, especially I would say here in Western Massachusetts is not only getting access to the test, but in the early going, all the tests had to be sent to Eastern Mass to be processed. So that sort of added an extra time to it. And I know in some cases, I've talked to colleagues in Berkshire County, they were sending police cars with tests in some cases um, where they had some critical tests that needed to be performed. So, so I think now we've, there's more testing happening, Bay State's doing testing, 
I believe even Cooley Dickinson can now do testing on site, but that, that definitely really impeded our ability to, uh, to, to fight this early on. It's great to hear that that maybe has been uh, at least improved, if not completely resolved. Um, one of the things that has become apparent just reading the news from around Massachusetts and around the country is just sort of how localized this is and the different kinds of uh, issues and experience that each state, each county, each town are actually going through. Um, what are some of the specific things that are happening in Northampton that, uh, that, uh, that um, you've been focusing on and that, that, are, are most, that you feel are most important to deal with to just help residents as they're trying to get through this time? Yeah, I think the big, the big issue is people are, are just craving information and, you know, everyone's, you know, uh, on the internet and looking at articles and just clinging to any kind of story or, or, or study or recommendation. So we've really been trying to just put information out to the public um, and just try to give them the best guidance that we have from our local health officials, from obviously from uh, the state and as well as the CDC. Um, you know, we've taken some steps in some cases a little bit out ahead of the state um, uh, in terms of closures locally, you know, um, closing all of our city parks and recreation areas. Um, yesterday, we, we announced, um, our Board of Health announced some measures related to supermarkets. Um, We've gotten a little bit of pushback. We, we've actually taken what the governor has recommended, but we've actually added some local components that we feel are really important. Um, so that's been, you know, one of the challenges I think about this is just a feeling that, you know, the federal government has been really, really slow to react. And then, you know, and then I will say, I know, you know, uh, the governor um, has been, you know, holding da daily press conferences and has his team engaged on this. And I appreciate all the work they're doing. Um, I do wish that we were taking a more aggressive stance as a state in terms of a more definitive stay at home order. Um, and so we're, so we're dealing now at the local level um, trying to interpret that. There's a lot of ascent businesses that have been deemed essential. Um, and that has a lot of ramifications, you know, construction sites and just even just like remodeling uh, jobs, which continue because it's been deemed an essential industry. Um, you know, we have inspectors who then have to go into those sites to inspect, uh, you know, to carry out the building code. So it's required us to try to adapt to that. And um, so those are the challenges I think we're facing is just trying to get information out and then trying to make sure that we put things in place that we feel are in the best interest of keeping uh, people safe and healthy in Northampton. I want to talk about the CARES Act a little bit and some of the state funding that's uh, going around aid for small businesses. I mean, as this is a huge health crisis and now it's a huge economic crisis. So is Northampton, I mean, do you guys expect that you're going to get enough funding from the federal government and from the state. Um, I mean, what comes to mind to me is the empty downtown storefronts. Yeah, yeah. Tough for business owners. Rents are already high. Yeah. Where are you going from here. Yeah, it's really that's one of my other major concerns. Is you know Northampton is is a has a. Uh, a, a lot of locally owned small businesses in our downtown and uh, and they already operate on thin margins you know on a good day um, so a lot most a lot of them are closed many of our restaurants um, some of our restaurants are staying open and doing the takeout um, and delivery um, you know we uh, we're definitely going to need significant state and federal assistance we did get a first infusion of the CDBG cares money um, four hundred thousand dollars um, and so we're, you know, trying to be strategic in how we allocate that and really focus on uh, our smallest uh, businesses and in some cases the ones that are still just trying to stay open and maybe need assistance to do that, whether it's helping them, you know, with a credit card machine they didn't have before to be able to process takeout or, or shields or some of the other things. Um, but so far, I know there's a lot of frustration, particularly about the SBA loans that have been announced. Um, and I've got people that are trying to do the applications online, and you've even been hearing these stories nationally, that it feels like that that whole program, things are just kind of going into a black hole and uh, people aren't hearing, there's not a feeling that those things are getting turned around quickly. So there's a lot of anxiety in our business community. I've been doing these types of Zoom calls with business leaders um, to try to strategize. There's a lot of local 
things happening, uh, local fundraisers and efforts to, you know, some of our landlords have stepped up and, and um, have said, you know, we're going to not do rent this month. Um, but it's definitely a concern, especially when you think that Massachusetts, we may not be entering the worst of this until May or June, according to some reports. So for a business to be shuttered for that long, employees to be laid off, um, it's, it's going to be a real challenge to dig ourselves out of this. So we need definitely more assistance from both the state and federal government. Well, also, what has it been like trying to run a city essentially suddenly remotely? You were at a four-hour meeting yesterday. What mm-hmm. what has changed in the process of actually keeping a municipality running? Yeah, it's it's required us to. You know, we we've often talked about you know things that we would love to do. Uh, you know, um, and now in many, you know in terms of making government more efficient and doing more online. And you know, I think Northampton has been on the leading edge of that. But this has really forced us to to hone in on some of those things um, and, uh, and, and figure them out. So we've, you know, we are keeping our core services open. Most of our, obviously public safety, public works, uh, those are, you know, those don't close, um, but many of our other uh, departments have gone remote. So we've had to, our IT department has had to, you know, quickly set up a bunch of people to be able to work remotely and be able to kind of mirror their computer at work and be able to work through that. Um, setting up phones in some cases, uh, going remote with those, um, and really, again, trying to communicate with residents so that they know that they can still call their city government, they can still call the senior center, you know, things like the senior center, you know, which is a major gathering place for a lot of seniors who are in many cases shut in or don't have access to food, we've had to turn into now a big outreach agency. So we've got people that are calling seniors you know, the seniors that used to come to the, and doing check-ins with them, and how are you doing, are you okay, um, and doing bag lunches, and so we're, 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 we're adapting, I'm really proud of our staff for the way that we're adapting, even our arts, uh, you know, we've got a lot of artists in our community, it's, a, it's an arts town, and so our arts department has been thinking, okay, how do we, how do we repurpose and, and try to assist now many of these artists, um, which, you know, are often self-employed, and they're, you know, they're not they're not, they're not the kind of folks who are going to get a traditional unemployment check. So, and also, how do we how do we uh, still maintain community and community arts um, in a setting where we're all isolated? So, we're working across a lot of different departments to try to to do that. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm again, I'm really proud of our staff for the way that they've tried to adapt. But it is challenging doing a school committee meeting, doing a city council meeting. Um, some of those things are um, have become a little challenging. Um, we had a little Zoom bombing incident at our city council a couple of weeks ago, um, so we're adapting, but uh, but it's it's definitely a a new uh, a new challenge on many fronts. So we're so it, a lot of the news and commentary, and it just I think necessarily uh, family conversations too are focused on the here and now. Um, but one thing caught my eye in a Mass Live article uh, where you were interviewed talking about looking at the post crisis period, post crisis period, um, and you, you said while we address the short term emergency, we need to start planning for recovery. Uh, COVID nineteen has highlighted how much more expensive it is to address a broken system than to fix the system in the first place. Um, I wonder what you what things were in your mind when you were talking about that and uh, what kinds of what pieces of the system you were you were thinking about when um when when you made that comment you know i think on a lot of different issues i mean i think about our our health system you know which has been a concern for many of us um and you know even as an as a city uh you know the, the cost of health care and and the and our, and our employee-based health system and and we're really starting to see that um, play out. I think um, a lot of the issues around, um, you know, our preparedness for things like public health pandemics. You know, um, in, in terms of we we do a lot of uh, uh, we do a lot of uh, drills and we and we prepare and we you know have emergency management teams. Um, but it really feels like this has exposed some weaknesses in terms of our you know things like our stockpiles. Of, of equipment and our ability to get um, equipment to people that need them, including healthcare facilities. Um, and, and also I think, um, you know, education, it's gonna, this is gonna have a major impact on our, on our education system. I think we're, we're gonna see a lot of uh, children 
um, particularly those who are, you know, ha already are high needs and have emotional and social needs. Um, this is going to put a major strain and we're going to have to figure out, um, we're going to have a lot of catch up work to do uh, for students who are going to be really impacted and in some cases traumatized by this experience. So um, we're going to need to really redouble our efforts on a lot of different fronts and, um, and, and think about, um, you know, how we're going to put supports in place to, to really truly recover from this. Well, I think we've got to leave it there, but Northampton Mayor David Narkowitz, thanks for joining us and we're so glad that you're feeling better. Thank you and thank you, Stephanie, for, for inviting me on. Congrats on all your, your uh, great success in the 617. Uh, we get to say it, it all started out in the 413, so we're, we're proud. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Thank you. So Massachusetts residents are continuing to abide by their duty of social distancing, and this means they're spending hours, days, and weeks cooped up in their homes. We're among them, as you can see. <laughs> so with only the occasional stroll outside or essential trip to the pharmacy or grocery store providing our change of sceneries, what are people doing to pass the time? Will we come out of this as expert bakers? I won't. I won't do it. Uh, fitness gurus, also, not me. Or less optimistically, will we be more depressed and anxious than ever? <laughs> but anyway, here with the newest data from a Mass Inc. slash Blue Cross Blue Shield tracking poll is the crown prince of COVID-19 polling. It's such a depressing title, Steve. I was say, we Our really got to talk about that title. <laughs> After all the good titles we've yeah. given out over the years, that just feels so sad. <laughs> it's true. Our very own Steve Cazella here in the, in the virtual flesh. Steve, can you start by reminding us how the tracking poll works? This is the yeah. fourth wave. Yep. So the tracking poll basically is where you ask a similar set of questions over time. Uh, this is now the fourth wave that we did just kind of in the last week or so. It, it came out of the field on Sunday night um, and is just out today. Uh, it is. It goes back to mid March, so pretty much, pretty much coincided with when all the schools were canceled and everything, everything moved indoors and everybody started social distancing. That's when it started. Um, but now it's in its fourth, potentially final wave. We're still hoping we might be able to extend it, but uh, stay tuned on that one. So we know everybody's staying in, but Steve, I think you've got some intel on what everybody's doing in their houses. So what are people up to? Yeah, so that was what we looked at this this week. Was we, we've kind of, in addition to the questions we've been tracking, we took took a look at uh, what people said that they were doing more or less of, and found that um, the number one activity that people say they're doing more of is reading and watching the news. Ah. <laughs> Uh, that's six, sixty four percent said that they were doing that more. Only six percent say that they've uh, started watching less news. Um, we also just asked how closely people are following the coronavirus coronavirus uh, situation, and when you look at that number, that's uh, <clears throat> the the number say very closely, which is seventy two percent is the highest we've ever seen for any news story that we've we've uh, tracked is, you know, we've asked that same question about, you know, Boston 2024 and like lots of big stories that have happened over time in Massachusetts. And um, that's, but that's, that's the highest number. And then when you add in the somewhat closely, it's pretty much everybody is, is tuned in. I mean, I don't know how you could not be tuned in to be, to be honest. Um, but that, that was the number one activity. Um, number two actually is, is perhaps a bit more, optimistic is talking to family and friends has increased. Um, that 58% of people say they're doing more um, and almost everybody else, 36% say they're doing it at least the same amount. Um, so that's either by video or by telephone. Um, so those are the you? top two uh, it, it are watching the news and talking to your family. Are you two doing more of those two things? I don't know if it's possible for journalists to watch more news though. <laughs> I have a, like a legion of friends and family who text me every morning demanding to know when Governor Baker's press conference is going to be and when Trump's press conference is going to be. And then they text me throughout them with their observations. And like, it's like a lot of people. So, oh my. Uh, so when you're related to a journalist, I guess that would be both. You can read or watch the news and contact your family at the same time. <laughs> them all in a group text because I my phones are getting tired. <laughs> You're like this is this is what Twitter is for people. This is how right. you participate. <laughs> Could you just follow me on Twitter mom and stop <laughs> calling? <laughs> Oh, that's my nightmare. I do know, you know, we've got, I assume, also family members of yours into this podcast. So there, are, I've got some family members out in California that are now very up to date on what the Massachusetts coronavirus situation is. So I think for me, that counts as being in touch with family and friends too. Yeah. 
Yep. So those are the top two. Then um, number three and number three was watching TV. I think that probably is some news, but it's also, you know, we've, we've all seen the figures about like streaming services are just getting crushed with traffic. You know, everybody's watching uh, Tiger King, of course, Stephanie, everybody's watching Twilight, of course, Jen. So like, it's just, a, <laughs> it's just Steve, a thing that this, that people I will are... turn the zoom off. I will turn this car around. Now we're all watching Quibi for the for the Fall River documentary. That's right. That's I've seen a lot of people tweeting about that even outside of Massachusetts. <laughs> oh my gosh. Abs but also, speaking of Tiger King and coronavirus uh, overlap, did you guys see the tiger was able to get a test? Um, a zoo yeah. tested a tiger for coronavirus and people aren't able to get tests? I did, and very bizarrely, the tiger tested positive, which I don't even know what to do with that information. Is the tiger on a basketball team? <laughs> Stephanie, burn. Pivot, should, Steve, pivot. I was going to say, we need to move on from that. I don't even know where to go, go from there. <laughs> um, uh, rounding out the top five were uh, social media was also up there, which I think also is probably part of both staying in touch with your friends and family and watching the news, you know, because you can sort of think, um, obviously, it's a lot of people tuned more tuned into Facebook and Twitter following the news, um, but also just trying to stay in touch with family and friends and sort of share your experiences when you can't actually see them in person. Um, and then the other one that was up there was preparing your own meals and baking uh, was just below social media. So those are things that many people, though apparently not Jen Smith, are doing, doing more of. I don't cook. I have people cook for me. <laughs> Um, but so, I mean, the flip side of that is you'd expect there to be less takeout. Obviously, people can't go to restaurants. Did we see that too? Yeah, that's one that, that kind of has a, is, is very double-edged in the sense that, you know, almost everybody says they're eating as healthy or more healthy than they were before. Uh, most people say about as healthily as before, but uh, with so many more people cooking at home, so many more people cooking their own food, uh, takeout is way down. I mean, of course, there's, we all know the restaurants have been closed, so you can't, obviously, the restaurants aren't providing the sit-down experience for food. Um, but then the, the thing that's decreased the most is or ordering takeout. 53% uh, there say they're doing it less frequently, only 15% say that they're doing it more. Um, so we've all seen, uh, seen these campaigns of, you know, try to help out your local restaurants and so forth by doing delivery, doing takeout. Um, but it, it's, it's not, not in any way common uh, to be doing more, more takeout than you were doing before. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but every time I log on to Twitter or Instagram, there is somebody baking a loaf of sourdough bread. Literally, anywhere I look, there is sourdough bread. Is there, Steve, did you look into sourdough bread or is it just <laughs> support that people in media are obsessively baking bread? Uh, we lo only looked into baking and there did find a net increase. So 31% more, 14% less. Uh, I don't, right on the top of my, off the top of my head have the um, education and income breakdown on that, but I do know that they do tend to be skewed somewhat towards more educated and higher income individuals. Um, so it may have something to do with who particularly you follow on Instagram as to whether or not it appears that America has just gone on a baking binge. Um, but it, but it's not, it's not universal, but I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, the, the stores prepare for a certain level of activity that Americans tend to do. And then suddenly a third of them decide they're going to do it more. And that just crushes everything. It crushes the flour supply and crushes every other kind of ba baking thing. So it's not the thing that's picked up the most, but it's still enough that it will, it A, appears that everybody's doing it and B, uh, it really causes problems for anybody who would like to pick it up now. Are people working? Sorry, go ahead, Stephanie. I just find it interesting. You know, I went to the grocery store. I couldn't find eggs. There's not a lot of milk. People are baking bread. And I thought everybody was gluten-free and vegan. <laughs> Apparently that is no longer true. Well, I mean, my question is, are people also working out more? Like, are they trying to work off the bread or have we all just accepted, like, we are in nesting mode right now? Yeah, I think we're kind of taking the... Uh, one thing at a time approach on that, which is right now we'll just do the baking and the cooking and then later on maybe the exercising. Um, <clears throat> so the other two things that have decreased the most other than ordering takeout are exercising and spending time outside. 
Uh, so, th so 36 percent now say they're e exercising less, only 20 percent more, um, and spending time outside has actually gone down even more than that. Uh, both of those, interestingly, I think from sort of a policy standpoint, have decreased dramatically more in um, in urban areas than in rural areas. And I think some of that's probably inevitable in the sense that you think, okay, well, you know, you can go outside more easily in a, in a rural area without, you know, breaking social distancing guidelines and so forth. You know, you've got more space available to you. You're not trying to come out of an apartment building where you have to interact with surfaces that other people would touch and so forth. Um, but just, just to give you a sense of the magnitude, um, in urban areas, 68% of respondents say that they're now spending less time outside. Um, and that number in, in uh, rural areas is only 28%. So there's a 40 point gap in terms of the decrease in, in spending time outside. And what's more in rural areas, it's kind of balances out where some people are going out more, some people are going out less. In urban areas, it's all in one direction. Um, and the same thing is, is more or less true to, uh, to a somewhat lesser degree, just in terms of basic exercise. You know, it's just easier given the current context of don't go near anybody, you know, don't uh, wear a mask if you're outside or near anybody. Those, they're necessary. I don't, I, I don't mean to criticize them at all, but they do just make it more difficult to, uh, to exercise in an urban, ur urban area. So, um, Certainly something, you know, something to keep in, keep, keep in mind is that this is not just trying to keep ourselves healthy from, by preventing coronavirus. It's also having a negative effect on some people's health. And last week we talked a lot about jobs and all of the economic numbers. So Steve, this week, did you see another spike in people who lost their jobs or concerned about their finances? Yeah, so that's that's another thing that that's kind of continued to increase. So we'd been we'd seen for the last two weeks that 16% uh, of people said that they had lost a job since the coronavirus crisis began. Um, that number is now up to 20%. Um, it's it's a survey, so there's some imprecision in that. Um, it may be 18, it may be 19, it may be 22, uh, but it but it it appears to have ticked up. Um, and similar to past waves, it's much much worse and much higher among uh, lower income households among hourly workers, among um, part-time workers, all of those people, all, people who fit into all those groups are much more likely to say that they've lost a job. And if they still uh, do have a job, then that they, they've lost some portion of their pay. Um, the other thing that we're seeing among that group is, or among those groups that I just rattled off are, uh, another thing we asked about is whether you've been feeling sad or depressed more often or less often. And those same groups, um, so part-time workers, hourly workers, uh, and people who say that they've lost pay or lost a job are dramatically more likely to say that they have felt sad or depressed since this began. So certainly understandable, but I think it's, it, you know, again, focusing on health. It's like there's the prevention of the virus and the lessening of the pandemic, but then there's also the physical health of just being able to get enough exercise. And then there's the mental health of dealing with all the crises that we're already facing and all of the changes in society, and then also losing your job or also losing pay. Um, there, there's just a, a very, uh, there's a lot that, that uh, some people are facing. And I think that it's just important to remember as far as um, all the challenges that the, that the, the virus and the pandemic are, are creating. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that obviously we'll continue to keep an eye on as these polls come through and we track how people feel about the state, local responses, and what resources are available. But that takes us to the end of our show. Last week, we asked what's a new hobby you've developed, and almost everyone said baking. So I personally am <laughs> going to skate right past that one. Uh, this week, we're reinstating something to watch. So Stephanie, something, something that has been very interesting on Twitter this week to keep an eye on is something about Senator Ed Markey and signatures, because let us not forget, there is still a Senate race happening. What's going on with the signatures? So interesting. So something that's been going on, and it's been a lot of um, candidates who are new, who are running for open seats or running for smaller seats have been complaining that the state legislature should really change the signature requirements to get on the ballot. They're due in May and then they have to be certified in June. Uh, and they're saying, you know, to get the remaining signatures, it's not safe to go out and get 
signatures from people on the street or something like that. But somebody else who's fallen short of the signature requirements is Ed Markey. This campaign only has around 7,000 signatures according to the Globe, and I think they need 10,000. Uh, so he's going to have a tough slog to try to get those signatures between now and next month. Um, what they're going to do, it seems like, is do kind of a mailing thing. So they'll mail the papers to people, they'll sign them, and then they'll mail them back. Um, Joe Kennedy's already handed in around 15,000 signatures, his campaign said. Um, other states have updated this. They've taken it digital. I think New Jersey is a state that's put it all online. Um, and other campaigns are doing some creative ways to ways to work around this. Some people are collecting signatures online, not marquee, but other candidates in the hopes that the legislature will update it. Um, they may, they may not. Uh, they're looking at it. Uh, Rep. Paul Donato told me a couple of weeks ago that they they are looking at it, um, and it's got bipartisan support uh, from Democrats and Republicans uh, who are running for office who are looking for them to change this. But Ed Markey's in he's in a little bit of trouble right now to get all of those signatures. Right. Uh, his campaign is still is still tr trying to sound confident, but certainly that is not what you would most naturally expect from who would be having trouble gathering signatures. Um, before we go, though, I did want to just read some of the responses of things people they told us, things people said that they were doing more. Because some of them are actually kind of funny. Um, we had uh, one person say just rekindled old hobbies, uh, running and watching Bon Appetit cooking videos. He says not at the same time at the moment, but maybe that's to come. Um, lots of video games it sounds like uh, FIFA uh, Sam Hammer says Mario Kart oh and homeschooling um, we had baking homeschooling and uh, <laughs> I think this was perhaps my favorite uh, Lizzie Wyant our good friend Lizzie Wyant who's been a host of the pod in the past said competitive cheese it consumption <laughs> so I respect uh, that yeah, I was going to say, total fe feeling that. Lots of, lots of, uh, I, I can definitely relate to that. So uh, some of the things that people are doing more of. Uh, any that? new new hobbies on my side? Ooh, um, I, I don't know. I think mostly all of my hobbies have been like, trying to go to all of the virtual office hours because I feel like academics are a thing I need to do in law school, like pay attention to those. However, they've often descended because everyone's stir crazy, including the professors. They've often descended into just talking about what movies we all like. So we all got a good like, isn't when Harry met Sally great conversation in the other day. So that's been helping my general well-being. I don't know if it's a hobby though. I'll tell you what I've been doing, and this is, um, I rip, I rip through all of my podcasts because I'm just like, whenever I try to disconnect from the news, I listen to like funny podcasts like Who Weekly about celebrities or something like that. So what I've been doing is listening to old uh, episodes of podcasts from like 2016, 2017, like celebrity gossip podcasts, which are actually more funny and ridiculous when you listen to them a few years later. So after you finish the horse race, I would <laughs> that because it's, it's pretty relaxing but that is all the time we have for today so uh, i'm stephanie murray i'm jennifer smith and i'm steve Cazella, and our our uh, producer of course is libby gormley uh, find us online wherever you get your podcast please do leave us ratings and reviews tell people you like us um if you don't like us don't leave leave us ratings and reviews um, but for now that's all the time we have so thank you all so much for listening and we will see you next week <laughs>